Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and so the Lord wants me to talk about the importance of prayer today. Before I even get started, before we get into this, um, I'm going to read to you the parable about the per of the persistent widow. So this is Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 1. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. I want to rest on that for a second. Pray, but not lose heart. Pray, but not lose faith. Pray, but not lose hope. Pray, but don't give up. Pray and expect to receive what you're praying for. Verse two, he said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice. She kept coming to him. She didn't pray to him once or twice and give up because the answer hasn't come yet. She didn't pray to him once or twice and then lose heart. She didn't, she didn't stop there. She, she kept coming. She kept coming and saying, I want justice. She kept coming and saying, give me justice against my adversary. Verse four says, for a while he refused. But afterward, he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. How many of us know that persistence is important in prayer? Persistence is important in prayer. When you want heaven and earth to move on the behalf of, let's say, an unbelieving family member, you need to be persistent. When you're looking for a miracle of God, a mighty move of God, a supernatural healing, a one and done five minute prayer is not going to cut it. We need to be persistent. This widow keeps bothering me. So because she keeps coming to me and because she will not stay silent and because of her persistence, he says, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night again, day and night, relentlessly cry out to him, relentlessly plea with him, relentlessly present your petitions and requests and ask God to move on your behalf or the behalf of that person that you're praying for. Day and night. The next verse says, will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Faith is necessary in prayer. If you don't believe for it, if you are not expecting God to move on your behalf, that prayer is powerless. There needs to be faith behind your prayer. You need to believe not just in God, but you need to believe in God's promises. You need to believe that God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he's going to do. So let's talk about the importance of prayer, because I know, um, and me, myself included, right, that sometimes we're not praying as often as we should. We know the importance of prayer. It's, it's all over the Bible, but we don't always apply that principle or sometimes we get a little lax in our walk when it comes to prayer and we can't afford to do that so is there a particular posture in prayer is there a particular way for us to enter into prayer or to start a prayer yes yes the Bible tells us to enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That means we are to start every prayer thanking God before anything else. Before I break out my laundry list of requests, before I petition him for anything, before I ask him to move on my behalf or the behalf of my children or the behalf of my entire generational line, I want to enter into that prayer with thanksgiving. First and foremost, that's how we enter in to the posture of prayer. The next verse says, and his courts with praise. 
We want to start with thankfulness. We want to start with gratitude. Thank you, God, for all that you are and all that you have done for us. And then we want to move immediately into prayer. I really like to emphasize that his courts are almost like ushering in the presence of God. Why? Because he inhabits the praises of his people. So God responds, he moves, and he dwells within the praises of his people. Now, if you're not sure what to say when praising God, if you can't really articulate a, a praise just from your mind alone, King David knew how to praise the Lord like no other. So just meditate on the Psalms, study the Psalms, pay attention to how David spoke to the Lord, how David spoke to God. Philippians 4, 6 tells us not to be anxious about anything, anything. We're not supposed to worry. The Bible says not to fear in many different ways, 365 times. That's once for every day of the year. I think that's a lot of emphasis, right? On the fact that we're not supposed to be anxious. We're not supposed to worry. We're not supposed to enter into a place of doubt. But how many of us know how difficult it is to not be anxious about anything, right? Because if we sit with our flesh long enough, our flesh will dominate and tell us, of course you should worry because you're looking at an eviction notice. Of course you should worry because your mortgage is due and you're, you know, three months behind and you don't want to lose your house. Of course you should worry if you just found out that your child is hooked on, you know, a heavy drug. Of course you should worry, right? But what does worrying do? I want to ask you that. I want you to really seek and search for that answer within yourself. What has worrying ever done for me? What has an anxious thought ever done to change my situation, improve my situation? When have I ever benefited from being worried, from being doubtful, from being anxious? I think if you search your heart, you'll find out that the answer is never. Anxiety has never benefited you not once. Fear and frustration has never benefited you not once. Entering into a place of doubt actually hinders God from doing what he wants to do because without faith, it is impossible to please God and doubt is the opposite of faith. So it says, do not be anxious about anything. This means don't rehearse it in your mind. Don't go over it, you know, over and over again thinking about, you know, what am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Where is this going to come from? How am I going to get out of this mess? Don't do that to yourself. It's, it's, it's harmful. It's hurtful. It's never helpful. Then it goes on to say, but in everything, in everything, by prayer and supplication, here's that emphasis again on gratitude, with thanksgiving, so when everything is telling us to pray and to present our requests and supplication with what? Gratitude, thanksgiving, then we can make our requests known to God. Matthew 6, 6 says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. So there's actually a certain way that we're supposed to enter into personal prayer. When you pray, you're supposed to go away into a place that's away from distractions, that's away from all the background noise. Wherever you can go, go into your room and shut the door. Go for a walk if you have to, but find a quiet place to pray where nobody can see you, where there are no distractions and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So don't go into your prayer closet with your cell phone because that thing is going to be going off the minute that you try to pray, right? Satan loves to distract us from prayer because he knows how powerful prayer is. Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So we know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We're told this in the Bible. We're actually promised that temptation will come. In every form that it could possibly come, temptation will come. But we're also promised that the Lord will give us everything that we need to bear up patiently against it. 
but not if we don't pray first. Not if we don't pray first. So if Satan knows that you didn't pray that day, maybe he's going to throw temptation in your path that you can't bear up patiently against because you didn't pray against it so that you may not enter into it. It is very important that we not only watch for places where we can be tempted or where the devil is trying to tempt us, but also to pray that we don't enter into whatever that temptation is. This is something we should do daily before we leave the house to cover us because we know that temptation will come. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. First Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 tells us to rejoice always. What? Rejoice always. Today is a day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it, not just when things are going smoothly and according to plan, not just when things are going my way, not just when my circumstances are favorable, not just when there's no resistance or opposition in my path. No, it says to rejoice always. The next verse says, pray without ceasing. Are you praying without ceasing? Are you making your petitions and requests known to God? Are you entering into that prayer with thanksgiving, gratitude, and thankfulness? Are you praying without ceasing? When is the last time you prayed? Do you think as a Christian that if you miss a day of prayer that it's no big deal? I'm here to tell you that it is. We're in the last days. We can't afford to have a, a prayerless life as a Christian in the last days. With as much persecution as, as there is. And it's coming more and more into the United States. It's nothing like third world countries. But it's becoming more and more evident and apparent in the United States. In a way that we, we didn't really have to worry about it before. So we're supposed to pray without ceasing. Again, here's that emphasis. Give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. Even the unfavorable ones, even the ones that seem like everything is hopeless, like the walls are caving in on you, like you're under this extreme amount of pressure, you give thanks in all circumstances. Well, how do I do that? I promise you that if you look hard enough, there's always something to thank God for. If you look hard enough, there's always something to thank God for in the season that you're in. There are people right now who are praying for what you already have. Now, right after give thanks in all circumstances, it says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So sometimes we say, I don't really know what God wants for me. I don't really understand what his will is or if I'm walking in it. I'll tell you right now, if you're not giving thanks in all circumstances, you're not walking in his will. This is what it says. This is the word. This is not me trying to condemn anyone. This is what the word of God says. This is the will of God for us to give thanks in all circumstances. Believe me, I'm preaching to myself. How many of us grumble and complain? What happened in the Bible to the people that grumbled and complained? 23,000 of them dropped dead in a day. God does not like our complaining. We should give thanks in all circumstances. We should be appreciative of our little and lack or our abundance because he brings both. He brings both. And he still expects our thankfulness and our gratitude in either one. First Chronicles 16, 11 says, look to the Lord and his strength. Look to the Lord and his strength. Come to me who are all who are weary. And I, I know I'm preaching to myself, but how many of us don't go to the Lord immediately at the onset of weariness? Sometimes we go to the opposite. We, or we just look for a form of a, a escapism. 
Maybe we go take a nap, whatever it is. But we don't go directly to him. We need his strength. His power is made perfect in our weakness. Our flesh may fail, but the Lord is our portion forever. We need his strength. It says, look to the Lord in his strength. The next verse says, seek his face always. Not just on Sunday, not a couple times a week, not just when you have a problem, not just when you need something, not just when you want answers, guidance, or counsel. It says, seek his face always. Why? Because we need his strength. We need to be able to endure to the end, having done all to stand. That's what the Bible says. You need a supernatural strength. You need supernatural weapons. Our weapons are not carnal, but mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. We need to pray to draw upon a strength that's much greater than anything we possess. Ephesians 6, 18 says, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, all kinds of prayers and requests with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So this tells us when to pray. It says, pray in the spirit on all occasions, bringing all kinds of prayers and requests, not just pertaining to you. We're supposed to be praying for our brothers and sisters all over the world. We're supposed to be praying for those who are being persecuted, those who are being martyred for the faith, those are being that are being held against their will in prisons and told if they just denounce their faith, if they just deny their faith, if they just deny that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that all their suffering could come to an end and they won't do it. Those are the people we should be praying for, not just us not just our families, not just our immediate circle, not just our city and our town, our entire nation needs prayer right now. It says pray in the spirit on all occasions. So what is praying in the spirit? It's not just praying in tongues. It's praying with your mind and heart. It's praying with your mind and heart. So when you're praying in the spirit, you're actually envisioning in your mind and praying with your whole heart about the things that are happening in this world, the, the, the darkness and the lawlessness and the perversion that's covering the earth. You're praying against it and you're thinking about who specifically you are praying for and what you would like to see happen for those people. You might even envision them in chains, being loosed and set free. This is what it means to pray in the spirit. You're praying with your mind and your heart. Matthew 5, 44 says, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We know this, but do we apply it? It's one thing to be a hearer of the word. It's another thing to be a doer. When is the last time you prayed for somebody who mocked scoffed or slandered you and when i say pray for them i mean really prayed for them earnestly with your whole heart desiring that they would come to a knowledge of the truth desiring that they would be pulled out of the deception that they're in that the loss would be found desiring that they experience for themselves the steadfast love of the lord and his abundant mercy Search your heart today for that answer. And if you haven't prayed for the people who have been persecuting and slandering you, you can start today. Amen. Psalms 4.1, answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. God can give you relief from your distress. But a lot of times we try to find relief from our distress in, in other things that do not benefit they're not profitable it's only a temporary fix to an eternal problem give me relief from my distress have mercy on me and hear my prayer romans eight twenty six. in the same way the spirit helps us in our weaknesses 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. I want you to think about a time in your life where you were so broken, where you were so, whatever you want to call it, busted and disgusted, where you were so damaged, where you were so distraught that you couldn't even articulate a prayer if you wanted to. You couldn't even put into words what you were asking God for or even think about what needs to change. It says here that the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses because we don't know what we ought to pray for. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. How many of us know that tears are prayers? Cries and groans are prayers. When you come to him with a broken spirit and a contrite, a repentant heart, those are considered prayers. Whether you can articulate what's going on with you or not, how you're thinking, how you're feeling. If you can't think straight enough to form a prayer, those wordless groans are your prayer as his children. James 4.3 gives us some insight into why some of our prayers don't get answered. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. These are selfish prayers. The ones that are all about us, our blessings, our prosperity, our healing. Yes, we can pray for all of these things. But the intents of our heart and the motives behind our prayers can actually hinder our prayers from getting through or being answered. If all we do is always pray for us and not others, that shows us that our heart posture is, is all wrong. Because we were just told in, in a few verses beforehand that I was talking about how we're supposed to pray for all of God's people. Not just his children, but all of his people. Everyone who was created by God. Now, I'm just going to give you a testimony of my own. There was one time where I was avoiding the news like the plague. I didn't want to watch the news because the news was depressing and there was never anything good on the news. And I didn't feel good um, when I ha had been watching it and then walked away. It actually made me feel a lot worse. And one time the Holy Spirit said, turn on the news. And I said, Lord, I, I don't want to watch the news. And he was very emphatic. He said, turn on the news. So I turned on the news. And I started to see all the things that were going on in the world. And he said, there is a world out there so much greater than just your immediate circle. Because I was praying for my neighbors and friends, my, my co-workers, my family. But that was the gist of my prayer. And the Lord reminded me that there was a whole world out there that needed my prayer. And if I didn't know what was going on in it, I wouldn't know what to pray for. It was a big wake up call. And it changed my entire posture and my entire attitude around prayer, not revolving around me and those closest to me. James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. I feel the need to say that again. Therefore, confess your sins to each other. How many of us know there's power in confession? What's done in the dark must be brought to the light in order for you to receive freedom. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed, but not if we don't confess our sins, not if we don't acknowledge them, not if we don't repent of our sins. We have to actually confess them to each other. And that means we have to put our pride in our pocket and admit that life is not sunshine and rainbows 24-7 as a Christian, even though we love to put on that church face. 
We actually have to confess our sins to each other and admit that we have faults and flaws and that the only one perfect in this equation is Jesus Christ, even though our goal is to become more like him from glory to glory. It says, and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Did you know that there's actually an exchange that happens when you pray for another brother and sister in Christ? That a lot of times when you pray earnestly for another person's healing without thinking of yourself, that God will actually heal and deliver you? Did you know that happens? Did you know that there's some sort of exchange that happens in the spiritual realm when you're praying for another person's breakthrough, when you're praying for another person's healing and you're not thinking about yourself whatsoever? It says pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We have the righteousness of Christ. A righteous person is a born again believer a child of God who was formerly a child of wrath, but has been transported from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says, and when you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And when you stand praying, this means every time, every time that you enter into a posture of prayer, if you have anything against anyone, we are to forgive them. First, before we pray, but, and this may be a little discouraging, but it's the truth. A lot of times we don't know what's in our hearts because our heart is deceptive it's deceitful and desperately wicked and the next verse in the bible says and who can know it well glory be to god that the lord knows our hearts the thoughts and intents of it better than we ever will so if anyone knows whether or not you are harboring offenses in your heart it's the lord i would ask him to reveal to you if there is anyone that you have not forgiven, including yourself, when entering into prayer. But because we must forgive them so that we can be forgiven of our sins. So some hindrances to prayer that we've talked about so far are unforgiveness, not just towards others, but towards ourselves. And unforgiveness can come in the form of bitterness resentment, offense, murder in our heart, spite, vengeance, maliciousness, vindictiveness. That's all forms of unforgiveness. Another hindrance to prayer is asking with the wrong motives. Asking to become wealthy so that you can just Go on a bunch of vacations to places you always wanted to see. That's asking with the wrong motives. If you're asking for wealth because you want to expand the kingdom of God and you want to see the imbalances and the injustices um, that we see every day corrected and you want to be able to have some kind of influence or impact to be able to do that, but you know you can't do it without resources, that's different. The next one, I want to emphasize this, is not treating your wife with respect or honoring your wife. I want to clarify right now that you are not respecting or honoring your wife if you're being unfaithful or dishonest. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Husbands, likewise dwell with them with understanding giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered i want you to understand me it is a hindrance if you as a husband are praying 
And it could be for a family member that you just found out has a terminal illness. That your prayers can actually be hindered if you are living in a dishonest way. If you are not respectful of your wife. If you're always speaking down to her. If, it, if you're demeaning her. If you're degrading her. If you're always pointing out all of her flaws and accusing her of being dishonest when you're the one who's being dishonest your prayers can actually be hindered that's just something to think about matthew 6 11 says give us today our daily bread god has been emphasizing with me lately the importance of the lord's prayer he wanted me to say it daily the lord's prayer is um talking about his kingdom coming to the earth we want his kingdom to come to the earth we want to be forgiven of our trespasses and let go of offenses quickly the bible says then this is how you should pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen this really does need to be a prayer that we're saying often if we want the kingdom of heaven to come to the earth. If we want God's will to be done on the earth, we can expedite that if we would just incorporate that prayer into our daily prayers. Colossians 4.2 says to devote ourselves to prayer. Again, being watchful, looking out for what to pray for or where there is a need for prayer. And thankful. Again, gratitude is emphasized all over the place. Jeremiah 29, 12 says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all. Other versions say your whole heart. So this is not a half-hearted approach. This is not a watered-down approach. This is not a five-minute prayer. This is not a pray a prayer and then just expect God to move. No, we need to be persistent, remember? So in order to seek him with our whole heart, we need to seek him persistently and often and frequently and in all circumstances. So it's, it's not it's not giving the Lord scraps of your attention. We're to seek first the kingdom for all other things to be taken care of, for all other things to be added to us. He says, worry about my kingdom first. And the rest will take care of itself. Amen. Psalm 5.3 In the morning. Lord, you hear my voice in the morning. I lay my request before you and wait expectantly. There is something about early morning prayer. Jesus did it. Jesus got up very early in the morning and he went away to a quiet place to pray. And we should learn from this example. I know it's not it's not that easy sometimes to even have that, that time in the morning, but maybe you just need to get up earlier than usual. Or maybe you just you need to take that time in the car to shut the radio off or not play any music or worship or anything like that and just and just pray while driving just speak to the Lord you can just talk to him talking to him is prayer in the morning Lord you hear my voice in the morning I laid my request before you I not only laid my request before you but I'm waiting expectantly I'm waiting expecting you to move I'm waiting faithfully I'm believing in you for what I'm asking for. Faith is just a necessary component in prayer. So again, I hope this was helpful to somebody today. Now, I don't know um, what your prayer life looks like or how often you pray, but I do need to emphasize that the Bible tells us not only how important prayer is, 
but that we're supposed to pray on all occasions and we're supposed to pray without ceasing and we're supposed to pray day and night and we're supposed to intercede for our brothers and sisters in this nation and all across the world not just the people in our church not just the people in our immediate family and a prayerless christian is a powerless christian i want to say that again louder for the people in the back a prayerless christian is a powerless Christian, if you are not entering into the day with prayer, then what comes up against you, you are fighting in your own strength and your own ability. And you will fail in that fight and in that battle. You want the Lord of Heaven's armies to be your defender. And in order to have his protection, in order to have his provision, in order to draw upon his strength, we need to pray for these things. In order to overcome temptation, temptation, in order to bear up patiently against it, in order for his power to be made perfect in our weakness, we have to pray for these things. So it's okay if you've gotten off track, if you, you haven't been praying, praying like you should. I pray that you take heed to this. And that, you know, you would, even if you have to schedule time during the day, set aside time for God and God alone. No distractions, no phone, no social media, no, no, no nothing. Just it's me and you, God. If you have to schedule it in order to make sure it happens, then that's what you do. I know not all of us want to get into that that ritual-like tradition. But if that's what it takes to remind yourself to give time to God, to devote yourself to prayer, then that's what it takes. Again, I, I hope this was a blessing to many of you. Um, I love you all so very much. Um, I'm grateful that um, God has given me the opportunity to uh, feed his sheep and, and steward. But um, I just want to make sure I want, I want people to understand when you say thank you, I, I have no problem saying you're welcome. But I also need you to know that all the praise, all the honor, all the glory, all the reverence goes to the Lord, goes to Jesus Okay, he's the one that needs to receive all the praise because I couldn't do any of this apart from him. Apart from him, we can't do anything at all. Apart him, apart from him, we can't bear any fruit. Okay, apart from him, we are powerless. And so even on, on these things where I'm, you know, uh, teaching or edifying or empowering or encouraging someone, I'm, I'm not doing it apart from him. Because if he didn't show up, none of you would get fed. That's the truth. If he didn't show up, none of you would get fed. This would be a powerless word and it, it wouldn't do anything. But when the Lord is in it, all things are made possible. Amen.